Um, so thank you, Elizabeth, for coming in. Uh, we, we always like to get to know new city leaders. It's really, uh, other than Med when he was announced as a, an interim uh, at first, it's been a long time since we've had a new yeah, city manager. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I, 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 I guess first invite you to, to give us some uh, impressions of Keen so far from your perspective and, mm -hmm. and how things are operating here. So Keen is busy. Um, I, I, it's been a very fast pace uh, the first couple months. Um, I think that there's a lot of projects going on, there's a lot of people involved and um, different things in the community. Um, and it definitely is fast paced. If you hung out in my office for a while, you would see that I'm kind of bouncing from one thing to the next with not a lot of free time in between. So busy, um, but the community has been great and the people have been wonderful. Um, the mayor and the council and the staff have just been so helpful and welcoming to me. Um, that, you know, when you come into a new community like that, that's one of the things you're going to worry about. But I have felt the entire time that they want me to succeed. They want me to be successful. So they've been, you know, very helpful along the way. Um, and even Med and some of the things that he's been helping me with, everyone has been very helpful. And then um, living in the community, um, I have found that, and I've used this a few times, I don't think it's a unique phrase for me, but, to, but uh, I feel like we're an island, you know, so once you drive to Keene, you're in Keene, but everything is here that you could possibly want. Um, you know, it takes you a while to get here from anywhere, but when you get here, um, everything is here. And I'm still actually finding um, things I didn't know were here. Um, and, you know, so I think that the community is uh, rich in a lot of ways in terms of their assets that they have in the community, things for people to do, and arts and culture, and I'm having a hard time keeping up with it all, um, you know, trying to follow all of these different things that are happening and prioritizing um, sort of where to spend my time. So I'm very happy, very happy here. In terms of those priorities that you're talking yeah. about, what's topping your list to start At with? work? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll kind of tell you how um, the first month um, was really just focused on getting a handle on how things are done here in terms of the government, you know, the process and the organizational structure and um, right down to how we handle, you know, communications and um, processing, um, you know, different things in government. So getting a handle on that, um, really getting a handle on the individual departments. I spent a lot of time um, touring all of the different uh, city facilities and talking to the department heads and to the staff and meeting people. And um, I'm trying to understand how I might be able to help them, what sort of struggles are they having, uh, what sort of challenges and getting to know that you know the council and the mayor and so I've spent you know there's 15 counselors and a mayor so that's a, a big group of people to get to know and talk to so I have had individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with them um, and so really just trying to get a sense of um, the government structure and the people involved and that was my sort of my first goal and I'm still doing that I don't know when that actually ends but I have also moved on to other areas um, so the you know one of the great things I think about being new is you get to ask a lot of questions um, and so every time something is given to me I ask the question okay why do we do that um, you know where is this you know how come we're doing it this way? Have you thought about doing it this way? So um, those things have just been naturally occurring in conversation. Um, so that that has been really great. And I've sort of moved now into the phase of getting out into the community more. 
Um, so, you know, a lot of conversations internally, not to say that there weren't people in the community that immediately came in to see me too, but now I'm actually doing outreach with the mayor. Um, we've been visiting businesses. We went to the second business today, and we're going to be doing that for a while and just talking to them about the same sort of things. You know, he wanted to introduce me um, to them, but also talk to them about what sort of struggles are they having, you know, what's going well and what isn't. Is there anything that the city can do? Um, and one, I'm, I'm hearing the same thing at these visits, so it sort of seems to be a theme of, um, you know, the retention issue in terms of um, recruiting employees to come and work for the companies. And that will be a, a major topic for us, I think, as we move forward um, with economic development because we can bring businesses here, um, but if we don't have anybody to work there, you know, they're not going to be able to save. So I've moved into first this sort of internal look and getting to know everyone and then out into starting to broaden out into the community more and, you know, get an understanding of what's happening in the business. Um, I also, you know, I have been spending my free time frequenting the businesses around the community, whether it's going out to dinner or just checking things out, um, going to the different stores. Also, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, what's happening, sort of making my own personal um, judgment about, you know, I'm sitting outside having dinner at a restaurant. How is this really working? <laughs> you know, people are walking between us and there's cars pulling up and all of that. So, you know, again, just really getting, getting a sense um, of the community, both inside the government and then outside. Um, and then we, you know, uh, you don't get free time. You know, while you're learning and you're, 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 you're doing all these things, the rest of the work doesn't stop. Um, so I'm still doing all of the normal things that you would need to do to process um, things, you know, projects, contracts, um, dealing with personnel issues, all of those things, and just completed the capital improvement plan, which was a very uh, extensive project to kind of um, go through all of the, the different projects that we have going on for the next six years. So. Yeah, that's... So you brought up workforce development. Yeah. And that's a um, topic that's near and dear to us right now because we're involved yeah. in some pretty substantial reporting on the issue. Mm -hmm. And I've actually traveled to a couple of the different parts of the state to meet with city leaders to find out uh, what they're doing, how they're tackling the issue, um, and learn that it's a very collaborative approach in a lot of places. Yeah. To your view, what is the city's role in workforce development? And have you thought about or do you imagine what a collaborative approach in Keene looks like, who the stakeholders are, who's involved in that? Yeah, so I have started thinking about that. Um, I don't really have all the answers yet, but I do definitely think we have a role to play because, you know, when we're talking to these businesses and we're hearing that this is a concern for them, that, you know, that's sort of like a shot across our bow to say, if it's not addressed, eventually they might reach the point of saying, okay, we may need to relocate. Um, and so we want them to be successful, so we have to find a way to help them be successful. And so I think we're probably going to be more um, in the uh, in terms of coordinating an effort, I'm hoping we'll take more of a, uh, a role in coordinating between the chamber, between the state, um, between uh, businesses, um, and I think city government. Um, there's probably more organizations that I haven't identified right now but um, I think that I think that coordinating some sort of effort of oh, the college yeah I should say the college I um, we've had conversations with the college we just had a meeting with them this week um, to talk about that um, to talk about ways to tie internships and you know programs that they have at both the college and also at the high school to tie it to what our businesses are needing. So right now I'm in the information gathering stage um, and trying to learn all the players, um, get an understanding of what the needs are, and then hopefully we'll then start to find a way to bring everybody together because it's going to take a lot of people to work on this. It's going to take a lot of groups, a lot of um, um, people, time, um, and effort to really try to move that um, 
into something productive. So the talks that you had with Keene State recently, you yeah. were involved directly in those? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This was a couple days ago. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the, just my, one other quick question goes going back to your opening remarks. Um, and when we talked at the Connect event, um, you yes. talked about you were, you were getting used to the, the structure of governance in Keene. And it yes. was committee heavy and yes. you hadn't decided yet whether that was for the better or for the worse or how you tackle that. Are you yeah. further along in your thinking relative to that? So I've done some work on that. Um, so two things. I think it's both internal and external committees um, um, and just sort of how we do things in general. Um, committees definitely perform an important function, but there are some things that you do not need a committee for. To be perfectly honest. Um, there are some things that, you know, you should just do, you should address, um, and you know, you should really know what those are. The more, um, the things that need broader input, um, a bigger project, something where you need to get, you know, diverse opinion on, you need to get buy-in on, then those are things that you really need the committee for. Um, but there are some things that I think we can do um, that probably don't require a committee, and I don't, Right now, I have asked the staff to put together a, le a list of our internal committees. Um, so those are things that the staff are attending and that how we're, pro we have quite a few of our own internal committees for different things. Um, and so I've asked them to put that together. They're in the process of doing that. And then we're going to look at the external committees. Now, I obviously do not decide who is on the external committees. Those are probably be the mayor and so well, what I want to do is take a look at sort of what the charge of each committee is and make sure it's still relevant. Um, we're doing that right now with the airport um, coming up at the next PLD committee meeting. There will be a recommendation to change the charge of the airport commi commission. Um, we've drafted something that is much shorter in nature um, and it really goes to the point of what we're looking for. We're looking for help with promoting, marketing, and developing the airport. We don't need help in deciding, you know, what uh, to buy for a piece of equipment or what we need to do in terms of, you know, fixing the bathroom. Those are operational things that the airport manager, you know, can handle. Um, we need help in reaching out and finding ways to help develop the airport. So it'll be um, the charge, if approved by the council ultimately, um, will be very focused on that. And I think that will be helpful to the committee members too because I got a sense at, the at their last, well, a couple of meetings ago that some of them were a little bit frustrated because they were used to doing it a certain way. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have to make sure that they feel that their time is being valued, that they're being useful. And so I think this, if we're able to, my, my thought is um, if we're able to sort of brainstorm with the commission ways in which we can do this sort of outreach and then ask them to come back and report, so have different things to do, different asks of committee members, and then come back uh, the next meeting and report that we might actually make some difference and you know make some movement in that area. So I'm looking at charges of committees, I'm looking at how we're doing business, I'm looking at you know what ones still make sense, what ones just aren't even relevant anymore, mm -hmm. um, and are there things that we could do to make, make those committees more effective. So you mentioned uh, meeting with Melinda and the yes. people at the college, yeah. uh, and, and obviously it's a it's a big part of the city yes. uh, to have a college here. Um, we have had in the past uh, and, and continue to have a, a city college uh, panel. The commission? Yeah. yeah. Um, you worked in Plymouth yeah. um, for quite a few years. Yes. And so how does that inform how you would approach the connection between the city and the college here. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're aware there have at times been tensions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, um, so first, the, the college commission, uh, I did attend their last meeting um, just to kind of get a sense. And again, we were also looking at their charge um, and what they were to be focused on and they were doing some reporting out as well. So 
Melinda and the mayor and I attended that last meeting and we had some sort of back and forth conversation with the members about how we could use their help. Um, you know, what sort of things we really could, could use help with. Um, and so I think that, um, I think that the commission can be useful if we are having, engaging with them about the things that we really could use help on. Um, I know that, you know, they've done some work in terms of off-campus neighborhoods um, in trying to address some of those issues, and they've partnered with the city, and I got to see that firsthand with the Pumpkin Festival um, because there was a lot of outreach in the neighborhoods with police, fire, code enforcement, and the college. And I think that we, it was so much outreach at one point that people were saying, the, the students in particular were saying, you again? You know, like, <laughs> really, how many times do you have to tell us we need to, you know, make sure we're not having parties and that we need to, you know, make the community proud? Um, so there was a lot of work to be proactive. Um, and I think that those are the types of partnerships that we're looking for because you're right, there are times that there are, you know, there are, there's a natural tension, but um, the the college does play an important role in our economy, and it does concern me that if they aren't successful in their reboot or reframing of, you know, re, uh, de, uh, correct sizing. I can't remember the the, the, the term she right used. Sizing. Right sizing. sizing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> You know, if that's not successful, and it, then we, you know, that's a concern to us because if you look around, you, you know, downtown, there are businesses that are here because the college is here. Um, so it's this balance um, that we're always trying to reach. And I will tell you the same thing in Plymouth. Um, they were all. It was the same thing. It was a balance, you know, between making sure they were paying their fair share. And not over, uh, you know, creating a, an overly big burden for the taxpayer, um, but also making sure that they, you know, that there was this partnership because we recognized um, the importance of the college in the community. So the commission can be helpful for that, but really the work, I think the work we need to have done will be done probably in the meetings that we're going to be having. Um, Melinda and I are setting up a monthly standing meeting um, to really start you know, working on some of these things, and I have, you know, some things I want to talk to her about, and, I, and I'm sure she'll have some things she wants to talk to me about, um, but I'm hoping that then we can, you know, have a, have a, a way to address things quicker, <laughs> um, and, and uh, find ways to, to work together. And the, this workforce issue is one. Uh, the things that I'm hearing from the businesses, I plan to bring back to her, and I know the mayor also has sometimes has, has coffee with Melinda, so he also has conversations with her. Um, but I, we definitely need to get back to her about what we're hearing in terms of whether or not you know the college and the internship program and the relationship is working and how, because maybe there's an idea in there that will help them also. You know, maybe there's a way that they can expand a program that will be beneficial to them and an employer that's willing to really have a strong connection. Um, to the college. So the commission is helpful and very important and I think it, where it does a lot of good work is in the neighborhoods, um, kind of helping to resolve some of the neighborhood issues and getting out there. Um, but I think there's still going to be that has to be those direct conversations um, between the, the college and the city to address other uh, issues and think long term. When you talk about the uh, one of the issues being that they pay their fair share. Yeah. What what thoughts do you have on how that is best done? So, you know, um, in Plymouth, I spent a lot of time on that subject. Um, I um, I had started out as Plymouth's finance director before I became their town administrator, and so. I did a lot of work in terms of looking at calls for service um, um, at the police department, not the fire department. Uh, in Plymouth, we made the argument that we wouldn't have needed a ladder truck if it wasn't for the college buildings because they had the taller buildings, and so therefore they paid for the ladder truck. And there, there was a um, you know it was difficult conversations at times. Um, I think that in the end, Keen benefited from what we did in Plymouth because they followed our contract after that was done. After it was negotiated, um, Keene used a very similar life safety services contract. Um, but 
Right now, um, we have a contract with them through 2019, and um, so I'll need to get a good handle on what's happening in police and fire and code enforcement and any other area um, and understand, you know, the impact on community services because that's usually the focus. Uh, the focus is on, on that. I know that um, there will probably be debate on how much that is and how best to do it, deal, you know, deal with it and what that number is. Um, but, you know, uh, I think that it'll be a good conversation to have. Um, the, the university system, um, particularly Kane State, is, it's been in the paper, um, you know, they've had some financial issues and they are trying to address those. And so I'm going to guess that it's going to be important to them to have um, these conversations in 2019 also from their end. Um, but at the same time, the the community has a lot of tax exempt property um, that we are providing services to. So again, it's about that balance and sort of figuring out what that balance is. Well, that actually was be where I thought this might go. As <laughs> Paul wrote last week, yeah. uh, we have about twenty five percent of the yeah. tax taxable land or tax yeah. base exactly. uh, is non-taxable uh, for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, how do you then address what is one of the highest tax rates in the state? Mm -hmm. uh, if you, I, I mean, that's, a, yeah. that's not the be all and end all of, right. of the revenue stream, but it, it's a bit, pretty big chunk that yes. there seems not to be a lot to be done about. Uh, so yeah. uh, taxes, how, do, how, mm -hmm. how is that on your agenda? You know, taxes is an interesting, you know, the tax rate in particular, it's an, um, it's an interesting thing. I think that different communities um, think about the tax rate in different ways. Um, and um, I, I, um, I think that probably Paul's story came out of some comments that I made in an FLP meeting um, about the tax rate, and I and I was talking a little bit about you know sort of the impact of tax exempt properties and um, and the need to increase our tax base and focus on that. And Paul did a great job with that article, by the way. He did a lot of research. I thought it came out really well. Um, and so my focus is and is not to look backwards, but to look forwards. Um, and say, how do we add to the tax base? Um, and I think that, you know, that's why economic development and redevelopment is so important. But honestly, the longer I'm here, the more I'm seeing it's going to be really hard for me to do economic development and redevelopment without workforce. Um, because if you don't have the workforce, you're not going to get the businesses to come here. That, that is what they're looking for. Um, so. They're going to go hand in hand. It's just going to make my job a little harder. Um, and I think so. I think that you know, I we have it is what it is. We have 25 percent of our, our property is tax exempt. Um, so if we want to look at creating um, new revenue to sustain the services that we provide right now, because the cost of services does not go down, it goes up. Um, then, you know, we need to look at creating revenue to offset that. And the other part of that, and I know this can be unpopular to say, but the other part of that is, you know, we're one portion of the tax rate, we have to look at all three. And, um, and I would even argue the fourth, which is the state. Um, but municipal is one piece of it, and um, the county and, and the school is another piece of it. And I think that finding ways to work together um, and s plan for those um, potential spikes in the tax rate. You know, I'm not, I hear more from property owners, and not a lot, but I've heard from a few about the tax rate, concern about the tax rate. Um, I'm not hearing it so much from businesses when I talk to them. It's the workforce. 
I haven't had anybody mention the tax rate or taxes. They said the water and sewer bill was more of a, an issue. Um, it's been the workforce has been on the top of their minds. Um, so the residents may be the ones that are more have been, you know, the one, have made more comments to me, and it hasn't been a lot about the tax rate. But regardless, at some point there's a breaking point for everyone, um, and you don't want to reach that breaking point. So that's why it's important to try to control costs and build the revenue that you need to provide the services um, that the community expects. So you mentioned controlling costs. Yeah. But, uh, so you're probably diving into the budget for yeah. the next yeah, cycle. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is your methodology any different than it's than it's been, or how you know? Are you how are you uh, approaching that, and and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what opportunities might you or might not you see there? Yeah, so, you know, I learned a long time ago, um, when you go into a new position, um, don't try to change the world all at once. Don't try to upset the apple cart too much in the beginning. You need to kind of gradually, because I have to have a really full understanding of um, the whole process the and the whole, you know, community, the tax rate, the expenses, the revenues. And I won't have a really full full understanding of, until I go through one in cycle, in my mind. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I haven't been pushing for certain things already. We've only done the capital part of the budget. Um, one thing that I have been, you know, I ask, while they're doing their presentations, I ask questions about you know, the same two. Why are we doing this? What is important? Do we have to do it? Can we do it this way? Have we looked at this grant? You know, we have those kinds of conversations. Um, and and um, that, that has been very good. But the one thing that is concerning to me um, in the budget, and I've made this um, uh, I've very clear, is the amount of um, debt that we have associated with roads, and therefore the amount of interest that we're paying on that every year. It's, it's huge. <laughs> and um, I know that's a concern for the council as well. And I attended, before I took the job, I started coming down to these workshops um, when I could, and I attended a workshop on, was on roads, and they were talking about indebtedness. And so one thing you'll see, or if, and I'm sure it'll be, Paul will probably cover it in one of his stories at one of our FOP meetings, but when we come in to um, do the budget, they'll, there will be an opportunity to reduce bond indebtedness um, for the road bond um, because of the amount of roads that we moved forward this year. And that's going to be controversial and lucky for me I don't have to make that decision. I'm just going to give them the options <laughs> and they'll make those decisions because it's hard because everyone wants their road fixed and you know and everyone's saying oh you know my road is so terrible and we have to invest in infrastructure and the, the, the problem doesn't go away but um, I feel that we need to start chipping away at um, that bond indebtedness specifically for roads um, because it's not just all new roads, some of it is maintenance of roads and that it's not, you know, you really, I don't think it's great practice to do that and I understand why we're where we're at and you're not going to change it overnight. Um, it's going to have to be a long term plan to make a difference in that area and so again it won't be a huge number. But I'm thinking you, they could probably reduce the bond um, by the bond payment by sixty to eighty thousand. Um, so you know it'll be it'll be up to them. The mechanism is that, is that because you don't incur additional bonding for new projects, and and then oh. as, as other bonds retire, that's how it comes down, or are you actually retiring debt as part of this? So it's a couple of things. Yes, we will, we retire debt as it naturally comes off. But what I'm looking to do is, as we're able to bump roads up on the list. So it, I, Paul covered it, us. Um, we talked about we got some additional funds from the state and you, um, to do some road projects. And so they moved several. They moved two roads forward, and they did some preventative maintenance. And and I was all for that plan. Um, but what I want to do is not just move two more roads now forward to the next budget um, and the same amount of money. I want a conversation <coughs> about whether or not we reduce that in the upcoming, you know, in the upcoming budget. 
And that will be a way for us to bring that bond and indebtedness down, even a small bit. And a lot of the things that I bring up and talk about, they're small numbers in terms of scope. Um, when you look at the whole budget or you look at, a whole, you know, if you even just look at the bond. Um, but and this is, I've been saying this over and over again, we're going to pick your way at it one at a time because you don't, you know, you don't eat an elephant all at once. You have to slowly make, uh, um, you have to slowly chip away at that. And um, I think that it's the same thing with the indebtedness. We're, we looked at, you know, what would it take us to get out of the bond indebtedness for roads and the the impact, and I don't remember it off my head, at the top of my head, because it was back in the summer at that workshop. But it was a huge number um, on the tax rate um, to just start paying paying it out. Um, and so I don't think that that anybody is um, excited or or jumping to do something like that. So we have to find other ways to be creative. Um, one other way, um, I've talked to the the finance director. Um, it's been a pretty good year so far. I should knock on something in terms of the winter. Um, and so it's already in December. And so if we have some money left at the end of the year, um, what I'd like to bring forward is um, an opportunity to do a road then. So then if you take a road that's on the fiscal 19 plan and you do it at, with end of the year money, again, you have an opportunity to reduce the, the upcoming year. So it's, it's just strategically thinking um, about how to do that um, as we move forward and looking for those small ways. And they're small, but they will add up over time. So you mentioned being surprised at how much yeah. um, bond debt there was for roads yeah. here and worked in a number of communities. Yeah. Um, what do you, is there something specific to Keene or how it has been done in the past that you think led to that number being higher than you would expect? Or? Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't know other than I think that, um, you know, they were doing a, they were doing a good, they have been doing a good job in terms of fixing their roads. And it costs money and they, instead of doing it directly as an outlay, they were doing it as the, the bond. And I think this goes back a, a long time. Um, and so, and now it's just gotten to the point where it's a big number and a big nut to crack. But I can't tell you why it started that way. Or, or how we got to this point, but I'm sure it's just, again, it's the balancing of the budget and the balancing of the needs. And so if they, you know, a road is a long-term investment, um, so I can see the argument for making a, you know, a bond or a note for a road, because it's expensive to do a road, depending on what you're doing. Um, so it's definitely justified. Um, it's just, you know, balancing um, how many roads to do, and then, um, you know, what to do with those roads and how you time that. Elizabeth, I just want to backtrack. You had mentioned that it made good sense to you for maybe the city and the school um, to be talking a little more closely as a, as a mechanism for helping to rein in the tax rate. Yeah. Um, um, and we've long advocated for that in our, in our yeah. editorial pages. That it's a dialogue we think ought to occur. But I wonder what you might imagine such a conversation or a regular meeting with them might achieve. So, I'm hoping that um, it will at least achieve less surprises. Um, you know, I think that even if we're talking about, if we're just talking about here's what's in our budget and here's what we have planned out, you know, and here's what we anticipate, it will how much it will impact the tax rate in these years, because we plan out a number of years. Um, and so, and, and I'm sure that the school and the county does that as well. So just kind of comparing notes and having that kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation, the tax rate's going to go up again um, this next year because there was a bond already approved for the county, and so it's going to you know increase, I think, 16 percent. The, the county portion will increase 16 percent, not overall. Um, so you know that those types of things and trying to find ways to time it, um, so that we are, you know, mitigating large jumps in the tax rate as best we can. We there's no, you know, the county can't control what the municipality does, and the municipality can't control what the county or the school does. So it's really just a matter of communication and finding ways to work together. You know, we do a lot of the same things. So so the school department they 
they have cleaning contracts and we have cleaning contracts and the, you know they have fields and facilities and we have fields and facilities so there's a lot of things that we might be able to look into to do to do differently so just opening up that dialogue so that we know when there's an issue coming for them that they're trying to deal with or coming for us maybe we can help them or maybe they can help us um, having having those types of conversations so one way in which perhaps you can help them is apparently they are interested in having carpenter feel bad um, can you talk a little bit about how you view uh, the efforts, not only their effort at someday maybe putting a, a new school on the east mm -hmm. side, but how that plays into the city's interest in, in the Kingsbury property mm -hmm. that's right there mm -hmm. and the redevelopment efforts on Marlboro Street and revitalization. Mm -hmm. uh, and at one point we had a, a, a one of your predecessors in talking uh, uh, about uh, a whole east side redevelopment along Beaver Brook. Um, how do you, what are your impressions of where that's going and, and where it ought to go? Mm. Um, so I did have a meeting with the school about this. Um, I had a meeting with the superintendent and the business administrator a week or so ago. Um, just to have some, they, I was looking just to have some conversations with them and they brought up this issue of Carpenter Field. And so I have asked for some additional information from them in terms of, um, I'm just wondering, um, the cost to renovate existing buildings versus building new um, and what sort of work that they, they have done on that and if there was anything that they could share because I'd love to be an advocate for them but if I, I would have to have more information and I um, and I'd also asked about just what they have what they are seeing in terms of their enrollment is it declining like most other schools and what will that look like in the future now specifically to Carpenter Field um, the city does have plans for Carpenter Field, um, a land and water grant uh, coming up in a couple of years to do some field improvements. Um, it's, it floods. It's in the floodway. <laughs> um, and it's wet. Um, so it, I think that um, the school would have a difficult time building on that site. Um, because while they may be exempt from local ordinances, they are not exempt from the state building code or FEMA regulations. So that, I think, would be a challenging site for them. Um, so I guess we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, but in terms of, you know, development for that area, I think that the Kingsbury property, um, I am waiting on a report to come from Southwest Planning. Um, a Brownsfield Phase 1 is being done for that site. It's probably going to be another month before I see it. Um, but that will tell me the extent of contamination on the site and the cost to clean it up. Um, I think that uh, until we have that report, um, the Kingsbury site needs to sit on the table and wait <laughs> until we know for sure the extent of the contamination and the cost to clean it up because the challenge is, is that there's only, um, EPA only gives $200,000 in cleanup grants um, and I suspect it's going to be a, a great deal more than that so there would have to be a very um, complicated package put together for that site if it was to be redeveloped in the future. So. I think there's a couple of things going on, um, and so with this, with the field and with the Kingsbury site, um, I think that they're both challenging. I'm not sure if that answered everything. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, could I, before we yeah, get to that topic, could I absolutely. follow up a little bit? Um, so this might be kind of a multi-part question, so bear with me. But um, the Kingsbury thing, I, I'm curious. I know until you have the more more information about the contamination yeah. you can't necessarily say this is how we want to proceed but are there kind of different options or tracks based on you know <coughs> if there's a high level of contamination what the city might do versus if it's pretty manageable 
wondering mm -hmm. if you could kind of play out that um, th those different options more. Um, and then mm -hmm. broadly in that Marlboro Street area, there's been several kind of big pieces of the redevelopment plan, the new zone zoning districts, 7090 tax credits, mm -hmm. um, and then the ERZ, Economic Revitalization Zone. Mm -hmm. Is there another kind of big piece in the pipeline, or is that more or less it? I'll answer the second one first. Okay. Sorry, that there, that's more or less it for now, <laughs> that there's nothing okay. else in the pipeline. Um, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the Kingsbury site, um, you know, if, let's say, let's say in a perfect world, it comes back and it's $200,000 to clean up the site, um, then we can apply for an EPA $200,000 cleanup grant, um, and the taxpayers would not have to subsidize at all the cleanup of that property. Um, but if it comes back with um, a substantially higher number, we have to come up with um, some sort of a plan, and it may not be evident what that plan is going to be for some time because you there has to be someone willing to develop it. There has to be um, identified other potential funding sources to make it the numbers work. Because what I worry about um, for the city is that you know taking on a project of that size without a plan. Is is kind of, is very it would be risky um, because it could be really costly, and when you do take a property, I don't, I'm not sure if you know this. So there's two different things. If you take a property for tax deeding um, and it's a brownsfield contaminated site, the city does get some automatic protection um, in terms of the EPA couldn't come back and try to. Um, blame the city for the contamination, but they would expect us to take measures to protect um, the surrounding areas, so that could mean a variety of things we could have to install. Monitoring wells, there could be a variety of things we would have to do um, to make sure that the site was secure and not creating any additional um, contamination um, you know, that would be originating from the site. So while there is some, and then, and, and then if you were to buy it, um, outright buy it, someone said buy it, not out of tax deeding, um, you have the, you're in the chain of um, ownership now to be potentially held responsible for cleanup. So is the city at this point considering taking possession of that property in some form, buying or tax related reasons? I haven't heard of any discussion about buying that property, <laughs> um, and I don't know if tax deeding would be an option um, right now, so I don't, I'm not sure. But we, the city has had uh, discussions in the past about how much it would potentially be a benefit to have that property. Yeah in terms of flood amelioration and yes. uh, for starters. Um, so there, there clearly has been an interest there. Yes. I, I, you mentioned several times um, economic development. Yeah. Um, and you talked about the, the idea of uh, looking at committees and is who does what and what the charges are of mm -hmm. various committees, both I internal city staff committees and, you know, the, I guess, elected appointed committees in the city as yeah. well would probably uh, fall into that. There's long been a complaint from some developers, business people, uh, and even taxpayers that the Keene City government is anti-business. Mm. Uh, and I wonder if you have heard that kind of thing as a reputational mm -hmm. thing. And uh, not to say that it's true, but if the structure of the committees that oversee mm -hmm. business development, mm -hmm. how many there are, what each of them is looking at, mm -hmm. uh, whether there's any redundancy there, plays a part in that, mm -hmm. if that would be something you'd be looking at. Um, how, do you, how do you address that reputational 
aspect yeah. to begin with, I guess. Yeah. First, I want to just comment about the Kingsbury. Yes, there is an interest in the Kingsbury site for flood uh, mitigation and also right away to Victoria Extension. So we do have an interest. In, I'm not saying that we're, there isn't an interest and in that if we couldn't figure out a plan for it, that we might try to make it work. Um, I'm just worried about what that would cost and what what sort of liabilities we would take on and so need would need to know that first. Um, so for economic development um, and um, the reputation that you talk about in terms of um, you know developers feeling that we're not easy to work with. Um, I have heard that. Um, it's been anecdotally. I haven't heard it from anyone personally. You know, some I haven't had a developer come up and say that to me. Um, but I do know that developers are looking for um, the process to be clearly identified for them. So typically, they don't mind playing by the rules as long as they know what the rules are, because. Um, for them and for everyone, time is money. So if they start investing money in, you know, developing a site, um, and then they're surprised by something, then they obviously would be very frustrated. Or if it drags out for so long um, that then something changes, you know, financing, interest rate goes up, whatever it might be, um, that also would create some frustration. Um, so we are looking at fourth floor reorganization, which I think is what you might be referencing. Um, we're looking at how we might be able to make the planning zone and code enforcement more integrated and find a way to streamline the process a bit more. Um, you know, I think that, I think that Everyone does a great job. I just think that sometimes what, what happens is is that we're all in our own little sectors doing our pieces, and we meet a lot <laughs> to talk about, you know, all the things that are happening, but still it doesn't mean that, you know, we get to make sure that we're moving things along through the process. So I am um, also looking, we're looking at doing the code rewrite which to make it easier um, for people to understand where things are and to have it all in one place and also to help with potential redevelopment in the downtown. So those are two really big projects that we're looking at that we're estimating it's going to take a year to a year and a half to complete, which to me sounds like forever. But um, I, I, I get why and it's because, you know, we're doing it um, in addition to the the things that we're already doing. So unless we want to take a bunch of those things off the plate and just work on the code rewrite, <laughs> we really can't do it at the speed of light. So we're kind of doing it together. And also with the code rewrite, uh, rewrite I know that um, people are also nervous about that and making sure that the public understands what we're doing and that um, they're on board with it and that we don't go so many months into the process and then you know be on the wrong track. So we have to have times where we're checking in, um, and um, we're looking at using the joint planning board um, process right now to kind of go back and forth um, to have some conversations. So yes, fourth floor reorganization, trying to make it clear what the rules are so people understand them, um, and. And so they also feel like they're moving through the process um, as efficiently as possible, um, hopefully by combining um, some of these departments and, and making it a little bit easier. And in that uh, downtown redevelopment yeah. uh, project, uh, I imagine one of the key topics in there would be parking. Um, Keena's, parking in downtown Keene has been a, an issue for decades, and, and now we have uh, several big projects uh, somewhat in the works that are exempt from having parking mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, standards applied to them that might make things even you know, more congested. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see coming in as potential solutions to that? To parking or the downtown? To, to, uh, to parking <laughs> issues. So um, I, I think that 
parking is a piece of it, but also looking at the downtown in terms of how vehicular and bicycles are moving through mm -hmm. the downtown. I think they all have to be looked at together. Um, and I, we had, you know, we had that listening session. It was three days. Uh, we're down here where we were taking input, and I went to one of those. One that was the first week I was here, and um, and I w it was really interesting because I was listening to the definition of downtown. You know, where does downtown end, and what does downtown look like, and it was different, and at, for for many people, it was very different. So, um, what I envision happening next and this is sort of the plan right now is that we've got our preliminary report from those um, engineers and we've looked at some what people want to see in the downtown and it, it deals with the you know what do they think the issues are in the downtown that are you know that they want to see addressed and we've gotten some concepts like four different versions of concepts and the next step is for us to really take um, uh, a more detailed look into the possibility of some of those concepts by looking at some traffic counts and doing some other um, analysis so that we can report back um, you know what might be possible because everything's possible if you have enough money to pay for it but there's again always a balance of uh, these are the things we want these are the things that we think we can accomplish um, and so we'll be kind of working on that but in the ver very early stages of this process we're trying to leave that as open as possible so that before we get into numbers we're just looking at needs like here's our traffic counts and here's what what we could do here's what it would look like and you know here's how we could potentially deal with bicyclists and um, and then get a sense of where, what the community wants, what the council wants, and then we'll start getting into more of the numbers. And um, actually, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm going to Concord. Um, there's four of us: the mayor, myself, Med, and um, Rebecca are going to Concord for an economic development meeting to hear how Concord did their downtown, how they funded it, <laughs> um, and what sort of tips they might be able to give us in terms of how they worked with businesses, what sort of things they learned, and then we're gonna do a walking tour. I think, you know, we juggled some meetings around so that we could attend this because I think the timing is really right for us, um, and it's very early on in the planning stage, and they might be able to help us. I know they used a Tiger grant in terms of funding, um, and so we'll see what we come up with, with I, for ideas. But parking, um, I know that parking um, is an issue at certain times of the day. It's not an issue all the time. Um, and so maybe there are different ways we can deal with parking. Um, and right now we're trying to inventory spaces. Um, so I can come park on Gilbo Ave and go downtown anytime. This is almost always a place for me to park. Uh, unless the Colonial is having an event and the place is full, then we might be backed up further, but usually there's a place to park if you're willing to walk a little bit. Um, so I think that we're very accustomed to parking right out front of where we want to go. Um, and so that sometimes, you know, is an issue that we have to deal with. But the city's lot has vacancy. We're looking at the city's lot right now and we're inventorying who's in there, how much is it being used, and there's a lot of vacancy in the lot for it to be used for the public. Um, maybe we need to communicate that more. Maybe we need to market that more. I don't know why it's still, you know, it's vacant a good portion of the time. Or, um, so I think there is parking. Um, I think we need to shuffle it around a little maybe handle it a little bit differently um, so we'll be looking at that but you're right at some point if we keep building and we don't have some parking requirements there could be some additional pr pressure placed on parking and at some point in the future if we're really good at development then we'll have a parking problem that will um, force us to maybe do a parking garage but right now I don't think that that's the case um, not knowing how much vacancy we have uh, in the city municipal lot well, you mentioned having three or four options for yeah. the downtown. Yeah. What, what are the different? So um, what they did was they came up with um, four 
design phases or design options um, based on bullet points. And the report initially just had bullet points, and I said, oh, this just doesn't do me any good. I need to see what that means. And so they drafted it up and just um, to look to what it would look like. And um, it, it, one of them, you know, is specifically addressing the need for the outdoor seating in the restaurant. So it, it talks about that. And then there's um, a piece of it that addresses the bicycling. Um, but guess what? It might impact parking <laughs> um, because it would change how we park um, if we created this bicycle lane, potentially. Um, it, if we would have to parallel park, we're not going to get as many spaces as we are right now. But it becomes a lot safer um, when you have a bicycle lane. So again, we'll be there'll be judgment calls that will have to be made. Do we want to give up parking because we want to make sure bicyclists can get in the downtown and all the way around, or do we want to preserve the parking? You know, I, those are things that the um, community and the council will have to decide um, later on in the process. But so we looked at those types of options, and then I'm sure you heard about the pedestrian mall. That was. Uh, an option that oh, I think it was a resident that actually came up with this concept, and I have to tell you, it looks really cool. Just I looked at the I looked at the sketch, and um, it is it does look um, very appealing. It would make our downtown very unique, and there's no, there isn't one like it near us. There might be one in Vermont, um, but just having that pedestrian mall and this green space in the middle. Um, but we'll hear, I'm sure, I mean, you can play this out a little. You're going to hear concerns from business owners about access to their buildings and making sure we can have deliveries. And then we'll hear from the fire department about making sure we can get to the emergency calls. And so that's why I said we need to do some more work before we even know if some of these options are a possibility um, because we would have to reroute um, traffic. And so what would that look like? There's a possibility that you do one lane on one side and you don't take the whole um, roadway for that block. There's There are various combinations that, that we can look at. But y you know, you've been here a while, the fire department and this is coming through there pretty regularly every single day. So you know that's something that we're going to have to look at in terms of um, calls and where they're going to and all of that. Um, the pedestrian mall concept would have access through there for emergency, but not at the rate that not not the the as, at the frequency we're talking about. So, so it just uh, so it had a you know some shifting around of the parking, making it parallel, looking at a biking lane. It had a couple of di little different um, views of what the what the outside eating might look like, the spaces for that, and then it had the one that's the big idea, the the pedestrian mall area. Okay. Um. You actually had a sit down with, with another of our reporters, Steve Whitmore, uh, yeah, when you in first, the beginning, yes. first got yeah, here. Yeah. And um, one of the things that came up was uh, kind of in the the, uh, the realm of transparency. Yes, and you yes. told him transparency is particularly important yeah. when things aren't going well or when the yeah, news yes. is bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of the position you have, you've got uh, a 15-member city council to yeah. answer to, um, yeah. and you know, 23,000 residents to, yeah. <laughs> to, to answer, answer to. to. Right. Um, how, Doesn't it sound like a fun job? It does. It does. Yeah, you, you mentioned you played a couple of times. I'm thinking that's like a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <play>. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's how much is, is is image part of the job, or it projecting, is. or protecting, or 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 containing the image of the city? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, that's a really good question. Um, so I think that um, projecting the image, you know, like uh, so. I'll give you an example. Um, I was involved with an incident where the, we had a meth fire in the community and the, we had to shut down the school and block up the traffic and we had everybody you could possibly think of there and decamp decontamination sites and all this was going on. So um, not a great story to have on WMUR. Um, 
not a great thing for people to think about when they think about the community. Um, but it happened. Um, and so what I tried to do when I was answering questions was say, yes, you know, this, you know, this is what's happening. Um, but, um, you know, we are addressing uh, drugs in the community and um, here's what we're doing boom 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 and so if you're thinking about making meth here don't bother because you know here's the things that we're doing and so I tried to take a not so great situation and say but here is the other part of it this is what we're trying to do so we're, we're trying to be proactive we have this task force we're working on prevention we you know we're getting a drug dog these were all the things that were happening back then um, so that we weren't just focused on the stuff that wasn't so great at the time um, but you, you can't avoid it you have to answer it um, and I think that in terms of the community, I try to not, when something is happening, not get sucked in too much to the negativity. Um, I try to be optimistic about whatever it is, um, that it's not going to be easy, whatever we're doing is probably going to be challenging, um, but we can do it. And I think that believing that and really, you know, um, projecting that goes a long way um, because sometimes we can become our own worst enemies you know in terms of getting in sucked into the negativity um, and so I try not try not to do that um, but at the same time you have to be you know honest when you're having a big incident like a meth fire that you might not want to get on WMUR <laughs> so I, does that answer your question it gives us a great insight into to how you're thinking about this. <laughs> okay. All right. So one of the issues that uh, has been on people's minds here over the past year or a couple of years uh, has been uh, uh, indigent people downtown, mm -hmm. uh, panhandlers, homeless, um, in some cases uh, reports of drug use downtown that people were... Yeah were said about we had uh, with the hundred night shelter yeah. uh, that tried to move and get yes. shot down uh, in part because of concerns yeah. uh, about their clientele mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I think Steve may have asked you but a, a little bit about that topic yeah. uh, or on the fringes of that mm -hmm. and you talked about uh, making sure that everybody's communicating and that you approach it uh, at least the drug use part from yeah. a, you know, the kind of prevention yes. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but is there is there something that the city government specifically can do or ought to be doing um, uh, to make sure that uh, residents aren't accosted uh, and that the people who need services are getting those services in a place where they don't have to go three miles to this place and two miles to that place and, uh, yeah. and are, don't feel like they're shunted to the outskirts of the city. There, there, there seems like there's, there's a retention there, uh, mm -hmm. in Keene at least, uh, about having that stuff centralized and what the fallout of that is. What part does the city play in that? Um, so the city, I think that, you know, sets rules in terms of ordinances, um, but in terms of where a shelter is going to be located, I don't know how much of a role we actually play in that. Um, in terms of panhandling or disruption of people, you know, going into businesses or coming out of businesses. Um, again, unless they're breaking the law, um, there's not a lot we can do because it's such a delicate balance between, you know, not violating the person's rights and freedoms um, and at the same time, you know, making sure that we're holding up the laws that need to be, you know, enforced and uh, making sure people feel safe. 
I um, I think that you know I've had conversations with the Hundred Nights Shelter and um, I've talked to different organizations and I think that it's always important that people if they don't feel safe that they report it um, and if we have a police officer just come down and make sure that they feel comfortable um, but in terms of locating their shelter a lot of times it's, it is based on um, because there's no transportation to some of these other places the the issue that I had or, or the conversation really was focused on with the hundred nights when I first came here they I think were one of the first organizations to ask to meet with me so I went to their shelter and did a tour and we had a talk and they talked about the need for expansion and there I'm sure there is. They can. I'm sure they're going to get. They could provide me with numbers and to prove that there's a need for an expansion. My question to them was, um, have you asked the regional communities around us to participate in the cost for an expansion? Because I don't really think it's just a keen issue. I think this is much broader than that. And this is, I mean, communities are dealing with this all over in varying levels. Um, you know. You know, Concord was in the paper for a long time for Tent City and um, panhandling ordinances that ACLU challenged. And so there's all this, you know, balancing of um, what we can do legally, what we can't do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Um, and I don't know that there's a really a magic, you know, answer to that, that there's a perfect answer. Um, because there there is a need for it. Um, my wish would be for um, maybe the county or the state to take a more active role in it because welfare in general, um, social services, you know, if you're a larger community, you're just going to see more of it. And a lot of times communities around us, they don't have full-time hours, even though they should be available for some of these things. They might not be, and so they're come. People will come to where they know that there, you know, is avail. There's help available, um, and so I think that they're not just people that live here. They may be people that come here because they have a need, um, and now they're living here, and now they're now they're citizens, um, residents. Um, but I think that if we could find a way to regionally approach it where everyone was sort of helping with the issue um, and paying their fair share <laughs> of helping with the issue. Um, I think that that is a better way to do it than just leaving it up to all the communities individually to address it. Uh, and, and I think that in, in the end what you want to do is find programs that will help get the, the person, if they're homeless, sustainable and into a place of their own where that they can sustain themselves into the future. And, um, you know, that's, that's a long-term process, and that's more than just providing, you know, um, shelter for a night. And I think that there are some shelters that really are involved in that, um, but there, you know, it's, um, it's a lot more because it's a lot more than one thing because you also have mental health issues that are also impacting. Usually there's some sort of coexisting um, disorder of some sort or issue. Um, and so you get to tackle at a tackle at a variety of angles. But I think that every community is dealing with this issue at, in some way, shape, or form. And um, I think it should be a regional conversation um, and maybe a regional approach. Um, and maybe more assistance from the state. I wonder if you look down the road five years, ten years, what's your vision for Keene? So, five years, ten years, um, it takes a long time to get anything done, really. If you're going to talk about big change of any sort, it takes a long time. I think that, you know, hopefully, um, in 10 years or in, you know in five years we're making great progress towards um, building a stronger tie between the college and our businesses finding ways to uh, make sure that our businesses are staying strong and getting new interest in the community from outside um, to come here because Keene has a lot to offer um, and I think that you know sharing that with people and communicating that more um, 
there's nothing broken that needs to be fixed. Um, I'm just hoping that what I can do is um, help, you know, continue to uh, make it better, um, to, to make sure that, you know, we're continuing to build the tax base and provide the services and I don't know exactly um, what economic development and redevelopment is going to look like yet. Um, and that is going to take me a little bit of time to, to figure out. But I would love to say 10 years from now that I was part of something really great <laughs> that helped to build the tax base. Um, and that 10 years from now people were saying, Keene is a great place to do business. You should open up your business in Keene because they are awesome and they just, you know what to expect and you can get right through the process and they have all these wonderful services and amenities and, um, you know, you should go there. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be a big cheerleader for the city of Keene um, and I'm going to try my best um, to deal with issues as they arise so that we can say that 10 years from now. Um, and it will be incremental, I think, as we move forward. Um, but I think that, you know, that's what I'm hoping, I'm hoping for. Anything we didn't chat about that you would hope we might? We chatted about a we lot, did. yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. No, we talked about the downtown. We talked about all of these things pretty much. Yeah, we talked about the fourth floor. <laughs> we talked about committees. We talked about, you know, volunteers and really just the committee level and participation. And we talked, we talked a, a, about a lot. Um, so, um, you know, I think that you guys know that the the council has adopted an economic development action plan. And so for me, I have to start checking things off that list, right? I mean, that's my that's my job. They, they set out goals for me um, and they set out a plan and that's my playbook. <laughs> and so I, ha that's, I need to start incrementally working um, towards those things uh, and, tr and trying to get as far through that plan as I possibly can and then bring back to them what other things we might not have thought about because like every plan it's a li living document will change as opportunities come up so we'll see you know how quickly I can get through that <laughs> I think we just gave you 10 years <laughs> I like that 10 years I can I can do that in 10 years I can yeah we do have a history of city managers serving lengthy. I know, tenure. yeah. <laughs> you know, I did, I actually, that's one thing you should know that city managers do look at that when they're applying for a job. <laughs> they look at, um, they look at the tenure um, of the previous managers because, you know, they want to know if it's a stable environment to work. Um, they want to know that, you know, that they can go and be there and, and uh, be part of something. and. Um, so I, they do, we do look at that. We definitely look at that. So I'm hoping that will be the case for me as well. Well, thank you for your time. You're welcome. <laughs>